Okay, thanks a lot. Indeed, uh, my name is Norma Rivano and I'm a PhD at EPFL in Lausanne. And today I would like to present you my project about polar optical phonons in one dimensional materials, which is in collaboration with Nicola Marzari, my supervisor, and Thibaut Soye from the University of Montpellier. So whenever we are dealing with polar optical phonons, the kind of physics we have in mind is the one related to uh, the Froelich electron phonon coupling and the so-called LOTO splitting. Uh, this is something quite well understood in terms of 2D materials and three-dimensional materials as well. However, when it comes to the one-dimensional family of materials, there is still something missing in the full picture. And this is what we want to tackle in this project. So basically we want to, to reach a comprehensive understanding of the physics involved by exploiting a synergy between analytical model and density functional perturbation theory. So first of all, this is the outline. Uh, I'll start giving you some background. So the main motivations behind the choice of this topic and uh, reminding the theory in a nutshell about the LOTO splitting. Then I'll uh, shortly um, explain the key steps involved in the derivation of this analytical model we developed. I will then switch to the implementation part. So I'll try to explain what are the main modifications which we need to introduce in our initial code of reference, which is quantum espresso, in order to be able to simulate this kind of a physics in 1D. And last but not least, the results part. So I'll show how we can validate both the model and the implementation uh, based on a portfolio of relevant one-dimensional materials, chains, tubes, and wires. So I think there is no much need to stress how important low-dimensional materials have become in the last couple of decades. In particular, within the 1D family, semiconducting nanowires have been proposed for a variety of applications, ranging from electronics, optical coupling, quantum information, uh, energy applications, and so on. Now, the common denominator in all these applications is the crucial role played by transport and spectroscopy, which are both closely related to the knowledge and the capability of uh, understanding and predicting electron phonon properties and vibrational properties. So in this context, you can understand already how important it is to, to understand polar optical phonons in 1D. In fact, polar optical phonons, in particular in the long wavelength limit, carry an, a crucial information about the dimensionality of the material we are, uh, we are focusing on. And this is crucial both for uh, technological application and also for basic science. So let me recall briefly the theory. Uh, whenever we have a semiconducting material with uh, more than one atom per basis within the unit cell, and we have uh, some kind of modulation in the charge density, so non-zero Born effective charges, we expect to have as well polar optical phonons. Now, these polar optical phonons of the longitudinal kind, they are responsible for creating in the material uh, sort of oscillating dipoles interacting within each other. This interaction is long range and basically creates by the law of electrostatic an electric field in our material. This electric field is then felt by the atoms themselves as additional restorative forces corresponding to these specific atomic displacement patterns. So the final result of this loop is that the LO phonons are shifted higher in energy with respect to the other optical modes of our material, and in particular breaking the mechanical degeneracy if present with respect to the transverse optical modes, the, the TO ones. So this kind of dielectric shift can be modeled by means of this formula here. The crucial quantities are the Born effective charges modulating the strength of the dielectric effect. And in particular, this W, which is the Coulomb screen interaction encoding the crucial information about the dimensionality of our system. In particular, uh, in the literature, um, models, analytical models to describe this W have been developed and are quite well known. For three dimensional materials, we have a one over Q square behavior in the W, such that when we substitute into the original formula for the dielectric shift, we get a dielectric shift, which overall doesn't depend on the phonon momenta, and this constant across the very low wind zone. So we have a, the so-called LOTO splitting at gamma in three-dimensional materials. While in 2D, for example, we have a one over Q behavior, meaning that even when we substitute this into this formula, we get a linear dependence in terms of phonon momentum, and in particular, the dielectric shift will break down at gamma. And this is what we call LOTO splitting breakdown in 2D materials. Now for 1D materials, something similar is missing. So basically we have three goals for this project. 
First of all, we want to develop an analytical model able to describe exactly this W and so the, the dielectric shift in terms of uh, not only the phonon momentum, but also the, the effective sites of our one dimensional system. Then we also want to show how this analytical model could be easily turned into an um, experimental tool, quite important to interpret uh, Raman spectra. And finally, last but not least, we also want to provide the proper computational framework to treat this kind of physics. So to be able to simulate one dimensional systems and polar optical phonons in particular in the context of DFT and DFPT. In our case, our code of reference is quantum espresso. Okay, so let's start from the, the first building block, which is the analytical model. The analytical model we developed is basically an, uh, consists in solving an electrostatic problem in which our 1D material is sketched as a cylinder, uh, infinite along the z-axis, in which we have a periodic distribution of charge along the z-axis and an homogeneous distribution in the out of chain direction. So all the dielectric properties are confined within an effective radius T and are summarized by mean of these two diagonal tensors, the dielectric tensor and the Born effective charges tensor. At this point, the, uh, the main ingredient here is once again the polarization density associated to these polar optical phonons. Uh, this polarization density is responsible for creating an electric field, so the interaction within, in our, within our material. And in order to get uh, to these interactions, what we need to do is to sol solve the Poisson equation here, uh, in which the poten interaction potential that we get from it is called the Froelich potential. So it's exactly the same one related to the well-known Froelich electron phonon coupling. Now, solving this equation is not uh, uh, a trivial task, mathematically speaking. We need to apply the proper boundary condition to exploit the symmetries and the periodicity of our system. But once we do it, uh, what we get is the Froelich potential and the ratio between this in reciprocal space and the divergence of the polarization density will give us exactly what we called in this context, the Coulomb string interaction W. So once we have a W, we can plug it back into the expression for the dynamical matrix here. And once uh, this is in particular the long range contribution to the global dynamical matrix, and once diagonalized this matrix, we get the final phonon frequencies for the LO modes. Uh, I'm not reporting here yet the full formula for these uh, phonon frequencies, but I can already anticipate that based on uh, the math, we can already see that there is a dielectric shift breakdown in 1D as in 2D, but the asymptotic trend is not linear anymore, it's logarithmic in nature. Okay, so we have a model. Uh, as I told you, we want to exploit the synergy between analytical models and the FPT. So at this point, we wonder what do we miss in quantum espresso in order to be able to simulate this kind of physics. Mainly, we need to implement two modifications in our code. The first one, which is also the most important one, is the one-dimensional Coulomb cutoff technique. So the idea is that most of the ab initio codes out there relying on plane waves rely as well on periodic boundary conditions. So basically, we are never simulated the 1D system on its own, but we are most likely simulated the 1D system plus a certain amount of vacuum and all the periodic replica in the three-dimensional space. So this is, let's say, um, good enough for most of the properties we could be interested in. Um, if we choose, uh, let's say, a, a vacuum which is large enough. However, the picture breaks, breaks down when we want to deal with uh, perturbation, which are long wavelength in nature. So the idea is that uh, if we focus on the electronic charge density along the axis, what we see is that when we perturb this uh, electronic cloud, this will respond uh, on the out of chain direction on the same length scale set by the lambda of the perturbation. Meaning that if the perturbation is long wavelength, so large lambda, the interaction uh, that we are including in our calculation will be also the spurious one coming from the periodic replica of our system. So the system is not the 1D, but it's rather a sort of a bulk, weakly bounded material. Now, the idea to solve this issue is this one, and it's rather simple and not new at all in the literature. Uh, in our code, all the potential are defined as the convolution between a charge density and the Coulombic kernel. So the idea is to cut, to truncate the Coulombic, Coulombic kernel in such a way that basically we still have the 1D physics within a slab centered around the, the wire and a zero kernel outside. So in the end, we get potentials which are smooth, 
and corresponding to the physical 1D situation that we want to simulate. In practice, this is equivalent to uh, finding the correct description for this truncated cutoff in a reciprocal space. This is our um, proposed modified version of a cutoff based on what has been done in this work from Rhodes and collaborator from 2006. And basically this correction will involve not only the Coulomb kernel per se, but also the derivatives needed to compute all the quantities we are interested in at a DFT and DFPT level, which is the true novelty of this work. So basically the modifications will involve not only energies, forces and stress, but also and mostly phonons and electron phonon coupling. And I'll show you soon how crucial this implementation is in terms of polar optical phonons in particular. Okay, the second issue, this is less relevant, but still rather useful, it's the Fourier interpolation. So whenever we want to compute a full phonon dispersion, what we do usually is to compute phonons on a, the dynamical matrix for phonons on a coarse grid of Q, of Q momenta. And then we go back to real space, we interpolate, and we, we get the final full phonon dispersion. Uh, the issue, which is not something specific for 1D, but it's also true for 2D and three-dimensional materials, is that dipole-dipole interaction in the case of polar phonons are not short range, but are long range. And this Fourier interpolation scheme instead relies on the localization in real space of interatomic force constants. So the idea uh, already implemented in quantum espresso is to basically split the dynamical matrix in two contributions, short range and long range, in such a way that we can easily uh, subtract the long range contribution before the interpolation and re-add it just after. Of course, the caveat is that we need an analytical form for this long range term here, which is already available as I showed you in uh, one of the first slides for 2D and 3D. It was still missing for 1D, but this is exactly what we get from our analytical model. So once we have a formula, we just need to parameter parameterize it in a reasonable way. And the parameters uh, which we need in the case of 1D materials is the effective radius and the 1D dielectric tensor. So concerning the radius, uh, we can decide how to automatize the procedure, but intuitively we just have to look at the charge density of our material and choose a reasonable threshold in such a way to define this effective radius. This can be done, uh, for example, using envi the environment code within quantum espresso as a post-processing or just by making reasonable choices within our code. However, once we have this radius, we need to focus on the bigger problem, which is the dielectric tensor. As most of you know, probably the dielectric tensor in low-dimensional material is not well defined, uh, but still due to the way our model is built, we need to define these quantities. So first of all, we make uh, this kind of isotropic assumption just for the sake of simplicity. And then we realize that the quantity which is most relevant is not the dielectric tensor, which is meaningless, but it's the polariz polarizability. So the polarizability should be conserved within the quantum espresso calculation and the effective cylinder uh, model. And so from this relationship and uh, considering the limit uh, of uh, small radii, we get the final expression for the components of uh, the dielectric tensor. So once we have this parameter, we have the Fourier interpolation and hopefully uh, we should be able to interpolate smoothly in between different Q points. So at this point, we have uh, our model, we have the DFPT, and we can go to the results section. So we want to validate both the model and the uh, implementation, and to try to understand a bit more of the physics involved in all this dielectric shift in 1D. The first uh, case study we focused on is the atomic chain, boron nitride atomic chain. So it's the ultimate 1D material, one atom thick. We choose boron and nitrogen because we know that we expect uh, large boron effective charges and so a um, noticeable uh, dielectric uh, effect in this material. Um, and the first plot I'm going to show you is this one. So here you can fully appreciate the importance of the correct implementation of a 1D framework within Quantum Espresso. In fact, if you focus on the red curve here, you can see the yellow branch uh, as we get it from the standard version of Quantum Espresso. So in accounting also for the periodic replica in our, of our systems. Instead, if we implement the cutoff, this is the discrepancy between the two, the two modes. And so we, we basically uh, see an overbending of the, of the, and a softening of the low mode due to the fact that we are not anymore considering those spurious interaction. 
Now we can understand a bit better what is happening here if you look at the full formula coming from uh, our model. If you remember before, I showed you, I tried to explain the model, but I didn't show you the final formula. Uh, the formula is this one. At the first sight, it may look a bit complicated, but it's actually quite easy to understand what is happening here. Uh, indeed, if you focus on the dielectric uh, shift term, so after the plus, we can, um, we can identify two contributions to, to the final shift. First of all, this term, it's basically the well-known three-dimensional LOTO splitting we are familiar with. Then in the brackets, in the brackets, we have the 1D proper behavior of these polar optical phonons. So basically, if we consider the limit of a, a large phonon momenta, so if we go closer to the Brillo, Brillo and zone edge, uh, somehow our material is a three-dimensional one. And this term will go to zero, and we are left only with a 3D contribution. We can easily understand this if we imagine that the electric field lines associated to the polarization density caused by polarity are, in, the in this case, confined within our one-dimensional material. And so basically, the material perceives itself as three-dimensional, as bulk. Instead, if we consider the long wavelength limit, so uh, small q, we are getting closer to gamma, we can focus on the LO branch here. And we see that, uh, first of all, this term will go to one. So basically, we'll have a breakdown of the dielectric shift as announced. And the asymptotic trend is a sort of logarithmic behind all this modified Bessel function and Gmeier function. So we can see further, we can plot on top of the DFPT results our model. So this is not a fit, it's just the analytical model on top of DFPT. And we can see that indeed our model is pretty good in reproducing the long wavelength limit for this kind of polar optical phonons in 1D. So at this point, everything seems to work fine, uh, implementation and our the physical understanding we get from our model. The last note I want to, to point out is that as you can see, uh, I said that we have a breakdown of the dielectric shift, but still there is a huge splitting between the TO mode and the LO mode here. And the reason is why it's pretty easy actually to understand. If you realize that in a one dimensional material, there is no reason in principle for the uh, atomic displacement patterns along the wire and outside the wire to be mechanically equivalent. So for this reason, in principle, in every 1D material, the two modes are not necessarily uh, degenerate at gamma. Okay, next case of next, next material we want to analyze is the um, boron nitrate nanotube. In this case, it's an armchair for four, and the same consideration as before are valid. So once again, in this plot, we can see how important is the cutoff in correctly uh, reproducing the LO branch. Uh, and thus excluding for the stray fields caused by the periodic boundary conditions. We can also plot, uh, we can zoom and we can see that once again, our model is pretty good on top of TFPT. And still there is a residual mechanical splitting, even in this case, for the same reason I mentioned above. Of course, this splitting is less pronounced with respect to the atomic chain. And this can be easily understood if you realize that uh, a nanotube is actually a sort of pseudo 1D material. So it's something in between a 1D material and a 2D material. So the, what we call TO modes, which are the tangential modes in this case, are similar to what we have in 2D, but not, but not exactly. So still we have a mechanical splitting in between LO modes and TO modes, but it's less pronounced. Uh, now, the other let's say that what we care about in the model is not only the dependence in terms of phonon momenta, but also in terms of size of the material. For this reason, we simulated not only a 4-4 nanotubes, but we decided to go further and simulate also 5-5 and 6-6. And the idea was exactly to use the interplay between the FPT and analytical models to understand uh, the kind of transition happening in between the 1D case, the proper 1D case represented by the chain and the smaller nanotube, and something which is closer to 2D, which is the larger nanotube here. Now, as you can see, we can basically summarize all the information here. So here there is a zoom on the LO modes and TO modes, and here just a zoom on the long wavelength behavior of LO branches for the three nanotubes. So what we can say is that, first of all, in terms of mechanical effects, when we increase the radius, indeed, we are increasing the curvature of our nanotube, 
and we are more and more tending towards the 2D limit. So the tangential mode I mentioned before, the one in orange here, are basically tending to close the gap with the optical uh, longitudinal optical modes. And this is because in 2D, in hexagonal baron nitride, we know that the modes are degenerate at gamma. So this is the kind of trend we expect in terms of mechanical splitting. As far as the dielectric shift is concerned instead, we can see even if the effect is not uh, dramatic, but we assist to a progressive linearization of a logarithmic branch of a low mode, uh, corresponding to the fact that we are slowly tending asymptotically to the 2D case. And I told you that the dielectric breakdown in 2D is linear uh, and not logarithmic. So this is more or less the idea, the fact that we can somehow explore the relationship and the links in between different dimensionalities. And something similar can be done, for example, also for nanowires, in which, of course, the limiting cases are 1D and 3D and non 2D, like in the case of 2D material you know, nanotubes. Um, so last case of study, uh, gallium arsenide nanowire. This is a really small nanowire, but I just want to show you same consideration as above. So once again, the, the effect of the cutoff is to soften the low branch, and is extremely important in the long wavelength limit. Once again, our results from the analytical model are on top of TFPT, and there is still a mechanical splitting in between the LO and TO modes that we identified. Now, with respect to boron nitride uh, uh, materials, gallium arsenide present, uh, presents smaller boron effective charges and lower phonons overall. So of course, the dielectric uh, effect and the changes also in terms of uh, DFPT are smaller with respect to the, the other cases I showed you before. But the reason why we are so interested in this kind of system is not only technological, first of all, but also uh, it's this one. So basically the um, original inspiration for this whole project came from this study carried out uh, TPFL in the Anna von Kuberta group by Kim Won Jong and collaborators in 2017. Basically they grew uh, nanowires having a bulky base, more or less 100 nanometers in size, and a needle-like uh, tip on top, more or less 10 nanometers. And what they uh, saw by looking at the Raman spectra was a downshift of yellow branch of more or less three centimeters to minus one. And in the paper, they argue that this should be related to some kind of quantum confinement effect. So let's say the idea behind this work was exactly to show that this kind of behavior can be explained, uh, explained in terms of dielectric uh, uh, breakdown of a dielectric shift in one dimensional materials. And qualitatively, uh, we, we, we demonstrated this basically, then being uh, um, quantitative on this point, it's, uh, it's somehow difficult because as I told you here, the uh, scale of variation related to these dielectric effects are rather small. And also simulating uh, and nanowires, it's not easy. They are computationally expensive. And so this is, let's say, an obstacle in parametrizing fully in an accurate way our formula and uh, compare with experiments. But the hope in the future with uh, uh, some exchange between theory and experiment is to be able to uh, be uh, quantitatively uh, predictive even for the case of gallium arsenide and not only for boron nitrate. Anyway, uh, starting from this experiment and this original idea, uh, we also realized how this kind of information could be easily turned into an experimental tool for the Raman community to interpret their spectra. In fact, this formula basically gives us a one-to-one -one relationship between the dielectric shift in terms of yellow phonons and the size of the system T. So in this plot, we uh, basically uh, try to give a proof of concept. So it's a Gedanken experiment. It's based on a, the atomic chain I showed you before. So we imagine to consider this chain and uh, add additional shells of atoms around the axis in such a way to increase progressively the size of the chain. And we study the evolution of yellow branch with respect to the size of the chain. Uh, we do it for different uh, Raman wavelengths. And uh, uh, this is exactly the kind of information that it's needed in order to characterize materials with Raman. So basically here, what you can see is exactly that if we, for example, decide to use a uh, laser, which is more or less 700 nanometers in wavelength, what we can see is the, that the discrepancy in the electric shift between a, a nanowire, which is more or less 20 uh, bore in terms of radius, 
and the one, a, a larger one of let's say 50 bore in radius, it's more or less 100 uh, centimeters to minus one. So the idea is that once we are able to parameterize fully this formula, so for example, having some uh, reliable data about Born effective charges, masses, um, dielectric properties in general, mechanical splitting and so on, our model is able to give exactly the sites of dielectric shift in terms of the sites of a material. And so we can predict uh, the position of the peaks or starting from the position of the peaks in the Raman spectra, understand what's the sites of the material we are studying. With this, I'd like to conclude. So to recap briefly, I, we developed an analytical model able to describe polar optical phonons in one-dimensional materials. We also developed the proper computational framework to simulate this kind of materials. And we showed how uh, this analytical model empowered by the FPT or by other experimental inputs can be turned into a ready-to-use experimental tool for the experimental community uh, to interpret uh, uh, this kind of spectra. We validated the full work, so both analytical model and implementation based on a portfolio of reason or meaningful one-dimensional materials, so atomic chains, nanotubes, and nanowares. And the final take-home messages are basically this one. So first of all, let's say the main point is that in 2D, in 1D, as in 2D, we experience a breakdown of a dielectric shift, but it's not anymore linear, it's logarithmic instead. Uh, the other important point is that in 1D, we always most likely have some kind of mechanical splitting in between the optical modes. And so this is something we should account for when we consider the uh, global splitting in between the optical modes. And finally, we also want to stress how important is the correct computational implementation, in particular the Coulomb cutoff within quantum express or any, or any other initio code in order to, uh, to get the, not only the quantitative uh, uh, aspects of this uh, kind of physics, but also the qualitative trends, because the, uh, as I showed you, the overall shape of the low branch changes significantly if we introduce the proper cutoff. And with this, I'd like to thank you, and I'm available for any question you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Norma, for this, uh, for this uh, nice presentation. I see some people switched on their cameras, so I guess they're ready for... Uh for questions. So if you have a question, uh, please, uh, please raise your hand in the reaction section. Let me see. So Mathieu was first, I think. Go ahead, please. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, I had a question about the effective thickness, which has been an issue for many, many years in 2D dielectric yeah. responses and so on. and Many formalisms are a little bit uh, random because they depend on the value of the thickness you use and how you define it and so on. Have you checked that your 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 one D uh, correction is somehow independent of the the thickness you use? And if you add more vacuum, it doesn't matter, or is it sensitive to that? So the effective thickness, I guess you mentioned, is uh, the one uh, uh, entering yeah. not in the cutoff implementation, but uh, in the model and yeah. the yeah. dynamical matrix correction. So I checked in terms of a Fourier interpolation, I checked, but more or less, uh, if the choice for, for this thickness is reasonable, we don't see any appreciable change in terms of a final dispersion. It's not extremely sensitive to the choice of a thickness. Uh, we are able to interpolate. Uh, however, of course, this is a limit of, uh, of the model. Um, for example, the, the ideal uh, probably way to go would be to switch to something similar to what um, uh, Stengel and Royo have been working on in the 2D framework. And so somehow avoid to parameterize the T and just uh, um, getting a, a full consistent formulation of a problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, up to now, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable choice that you can make easily. It's just, uh, of course, there are limitations related. And actually, for phonons, maybe this is not so important. It could be a bit more important if we want to be quantitative uh, in dealing with electron phonon coupling. Uh, but for phonons, uh, for interpolations at least, uh, it's not uh, at all a limit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe I can ask a very uh, general question. So, um, so you're using a, 
uh, a code that uses periodic periodicity in, in three dimensions mm -hmm. to do calculations for a 1D system. Of course, these codes have already been used for 2D uh, systems. So most of these codes, of course, very, very useful um, and very, uh, uh, let's say, simple to use because of the, of, of the fact that you can use the plane waves. I was just wondering at which point it would be useful maybe to, to, to write a, a new code, let's say that is dedicated to, to 1D systems using maybe localized basis functions. So you don't have to take this spurious interactions into account from the, uh, from the other systems in the, in, the, in, the, in the two periodic directions that are not really, not really there in, in reality. This is an interesting point. I have to admit, I'm not really familiar to other kinds of codes not relying on plane waves. I've always been working with uh, plane waves and periodic boundary conditions. But for sure, being a one dimensional material, something in between a solid and a, a molecule, basically, um, it's interesting trying to understand whenever uh, it would be better to switch to a different kind of framework. Um, I'm aware of different codes, but not. I have to be sincere, I'm not uh, really familiar with the limitations of these codes. And so let's say in this case, all the machinery of density functional perturbation theory, I guess it's the main advantage coming from, from relying on a similar code. Uh, but yeah, it, it's an interesting point. Yes, I don't know uh, if there are many other codes. I just know I, I've worked in the past with ADF and they okay. use a Slater basis. So in that case, Doing periodic boundary conditions in just one dimension is 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 uh, is possible. But, uh, yeah. uh, there's a question by Gianmarco. It's actually a comment to your comment, uh, Arjen. So there's actually a paper, a PRL from 2004 by uh, Eric Chan, Giovanni Gussi, Alice Ruin, and Elisa Molinari, in which they uh, try to take advantage of the symmetry of carbon nanotubes there to have uh, indeed the 1D system still using plane wave, if I'm not wrong. Okay, interesting, thanks. Maybe you can put the... the, the... Yeah, I will put the DOI in the chat, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, Mathieu, you have another question? Or another also comment? About your, okay. also comment about on your comment, comment on the comments. Because it, even if you have a, a 1D code, it, it makes the calculation lighter, but you still have the issue of defining the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant is really a 3D object. And if you try to do something, I mean, you have to look at something else. And as Norma said, the, the polarizability is the, the really well-defined local quantity. And But all the experimentalists want 3D dielectric constants. So it's really hard to talk to them. And you need uh, some kind of 1D or 2D concept to, 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 to match the two. It, it doesn't you're you're talking about the microscopic dielectric. Yeah, function, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, but the polarizability is well defined in any mm -hmm. dimensionality. I don't know if you want to comment, uh, Norma, before we go to the question of Gabriele. No, no, I agree. Uh, Gabriele, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the beautiful talk. I have a comment to what has been said just before, and then a, a quick question. The comment is that, uh, for instance, crystal is a code based on Gaussian atomic orbitals, which has all the machinery implemented for long range electrostatic, uh, let's say LOTO splitting uh, due to long range electrostatics, but in 3D, but it can perform calculation in one and, and 2D as well, but not accounting for this effect. Just a comment. And then my question is about your, your model. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you work on your model, you develop your model under the assumption that your dielectric contact is isotropic, which is something that looks a bit uh, uh, artificial, especially for material that have some covalence in 1D, where I would expect the largest polarizability along the axis with respect to the to the, to direction. Would it be possible to, to introduce this? into the model? Yeah, sure. It's just a matter of uh, mathematical complexity. Also, for example, I, I told you that I enforced uh, an isotropy assumption in between the out-of-chain uh, and uh, the in-chain components, but uh, one can easily extend to, to take advantage of a full dielectric tensor. It's just a matter of mathematical complexity, but that's all. Uh, the only point, I guess, is that uh, in this case, uh, the dielectric tensor per se is not really meaningful. So I'm not sure 
how much we we could uh, benefit of some kind of improvements uh, in uh, in complicating so much the the mathematical machinery let's say um for both the cases i analyzed more or less uh, this kind of uh, assumption, even if they seem quite dramatic, work fine. So probably more than uh, extending the, the description to a full day electric constant, I would rather go and look into the, um, the new kind of theory I mentioned before, the, the one from Royo and Stengel. Uh, because the math is quite complicated, so I'm not sure it's, it's really worth it. For the purposes we have here, this is quite good enough in the long wavelength limit. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see. I, do I see other questions? Uh, Gianmarco, you have another question, or this was you? Your, you still have your hand raised from your comments. Sorry, I still have my hand raised. <laughs> okay, okay. Are there any other questions? May I may, may ask a question? Yes, of course. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, in, in, I would like to interpret somewhere somewhat differently what, what I listened to. That is, suppose we are exactly at Q equals zero, not, not looking at what uh, happens at small Q. Then in two dimensions, I would say the, the Coulomb interaction doesn't play any role. So you, do, you don't have any contribution to the restoring force in the phonon from the macroscopic field. So I'm not got well if it is the same even in one dimension. That means yeah. in one dimension, like Q equals zero. Of course, you have a longitudinal transverse splitting, which is done, as you say, to the different mechanical properties of, of, of the oscillation. That's clear. But suppose that on, on top of that, I want to add the Coulomb interaction. Uh, of course, this only uh, may concern the longitudinal ones. But uh, in, in, if Q equals zero, there is no effect. Am I right? Exactly, it's, okay. it's like in 2D, just okay. uh, different as in 2D behavior. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, raise your hand or just uh, switch on your mic. Does not seem to be the case. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Norma, for this nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for being here and for the questions and for the discussion. And so see you next month.